And singularity is part thought experiment and part useful um, idea for drumming up publicity for artificial intelligence and thereby getting more money. The idea is that the attempt to get computers to work on a more human level by um, being able to learn and infer uh, and act in a more human kind of way. Um, the, the underlying idea is that if this gets to a point where computers equal um, humans, then because they are running on um, a substrate that is arguably more powerful um, than an actual brain, that they'll then start to outstrip us. And the technology will probably at that time be around for them to start redesigning themselves because humans can design artificial intelligence and if it gets to the point it's as good as a human then AI can design AI. That this will get out of control and uh, computers and robots will outstrip us completely and depending on the uh, uh, what you listen to um, and how how much they want to push the uh, catastrophic line um, will end up killing us all or recycling us for uh, for our component parts or, or whatever. Um, and that's, that tends to be the way that it's presented. It's much easier to present a catastrophe than it is to present friendly AI, which is uh, what I somehow suspect is more likely. Do you believe this is something that we will uh, ever get to or ever see? Over a long enough time scale, I think that human level artificial intelligence is completely inevitable. Um, if humanity hangs around for long enough and continues to progress in what it can do, then if you wait for long enough, as has been said before, um, can you make a machine think? Uh, sure, I'm a machine and I can think. At some point, it seems clear that uh, human-built machines get to a level of being as good as us and possibly outstripping us. The, the point of contention then is how long does it take? And there are fairly um, widely differing views on uh, the, the timescale that's actually involved. Ever since AI really got started in the 1950s, it's the, the you know, full human level AI has always been apparently on the horizon and has never um, quite appeared because it's just so hard. Now, well, I've been asked so many times to, to talk about this um, in recent months that I, I sort of went back and tried to find some good examples to give, and I found an absolute cracker, which is, um, I'm quoting Claude Shannon. In computer science circles, Claude Shannon is of the same kind of level as Einstein. Shannon is responsible for information theory, um, without which you have no internet, no mobile phones, pretty much no nothing. Um, and so this man is, was, is a giant in computer science. So this is, this is him talking in 1961. I confidently expect that within a matter of 10 or 15 years, something will emerge from the laboratories which is not too far from the robots of science fiction fame. <laughs> so, you know, many people have, have made this mistake before. And if you look at AI research, you find that in the 50s, people are saying it's on the horizon. Um, and then when it didn't deliver, everything died down and AI became deeply unfashionable. Then you had something called the, the Fifth Generation Computing Project, which was really heavily funded in Japan. Um, and they said they were going to solve AI by building big computers that would run a particular programming language called Prolog very, very fast. And that their, their main aim was going to be to make um, an AI that could play the game of Go um, at a human level. Um, this completely failed after many years of work and an awful lot of money. Um, and at that point, the hype cycle turned again and AI became deeply unfashionable. Um, and there's an interesting further point there, which is that there is still no proper um, Go player in AI that can beat genuine human experts. There's been some recent progress that's brought it forward, but it's still not there. It's far harder than chess, which is one of the things that makes it interesting. So chess is on an 8x8 board. Go is on a 19x19 board, which makes the space of possibilities vastly bigger than chess. I mean, chess is essentially a done deal, and even world champions now 
uh, accept this, but Go is much, much harder. One of the reasons that sometimes people put forward um, for the idea that human level AI is just around the corner is Moore's Law, which just says that essentially every 18 months, two years, give or take, you, you get a doubling in how much computer power you have. The thing is that that doesn't really buy you much with even something like the game of Go. Because yes, you get an exponential increase in um, how much computer power you have. Go is 19 by 19. I think the branching factor on average is about 250, which means that essentially if you want to look one move further ahead, you need 250 times more computing power. If you want to look two moves ahead, the amount you need is 250 squared. And Moore's Law just gets negated. This same argument would, would kill chess programs as well, okay, if all you relied on was getting more computing power. The reason that you can do good computer chess is that the algorithms are much cleverer. There's a way that you can almost, you know, most of the time, you can reduce the number of possibilities that you have to look through by very clever um, programming. Um, but the point is that getting more computer power isn't enough. You have to be much cleverer in the way in which you go about solving the problems. Now, whether there's something um, very fundamental in the way that brains do computation, well, I suspect there is, um, because if you ask a Go player, um, what do you think of this position? They're not thinking through all the ways uh, of getting 10 moves ahead. There, there's, a, there's a much more subtle pattern recognition kind of thing going on there, um, a lot of which is probably completely subconscious. Um, People might think of it as being their gut feeling. Exactly, yeah. The, the, they might, and it is, this comes up a lot. Um, it's, a, it's a big problem in AI because one of the approaches that people have explored in order to do AI is to try and get human experts to tell them how to solve a problem. The trouble is that human experts can't always articulate it. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, 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 that's a, a related thing. Um, but the, yeah, the, the idea that you just get more and more computer power isn't enough. You have to be really clever in how you do the algorithms as well. And the way in which brains actually do it is just not, on the whole, very well understood. People, people don't really know what's going on there. It's not just a philosophical argument, is it? it we it's, literally no. don't understand. Is that yeah. right? Am I right in that? No. People know a bit about how brains do certain things. But the really clever stuff is a complete mystery. From looking at what happens when people get bumps on the head, um, you know what various bits of bits of brain actually do. But if you, when you look at the higher kind of um, cognitive functions, um, I mean, I think my, my sort of favourite example here is our ability to um, have a focus of interest, okay? By which I mean, um, in our heads, we have huge quantities of information and almost every single bit of it is completely irrelevant right now. Okay, so I could be the world's biggest expert on the mating habits of the Patagonian fruit bad. But the fact is I'm sitting here talking to you on a particular subject. Now, I'm immediately excluding whatever I know about Patagonian fruit bats without having to consciously think what bits do I need to exclude? And I'm excluding what I know about um, how to drive and eating and drinking, what I have for lunch and all my memories about the last, you know, 30, 40 years of my life. Everything is unconsciously and immediately um, filtered out. And that's a big problem for AI software um, because it doesn't have the ability to do that. And the way in which your brain does that, as far as I'm aware, okay, please, if you're a neurophysiologist and I'm wrong, then feel free to send me a snotty email, which I will then read and with interest and ignore. Comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, leave a comment. <laughs> Yay. Hashtag, Holden's talking rubbish. Um, I don't mind, I'm thick-skinned. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, a lot of what's, what's going on in there is, is really not understood. And the, the other, there's another important thing here, which is, um, which follows on from this idea of uh, increasing computing power. Firstly, Moore's Law, as far as anyone can tell, is about to run out. It's going to run out very quickly. Um, because the circuitry in microchips is now getting so small that um, reliability is becoming an issue. If you actually look at the size of the things you're making on a microprocessor now, and you look in comparison at how big a grain of dust is, grain of dust, transistor, okay? Um, which is why you have to make these things in clean rooms. But you're getting so small now that it's getting to the point where you have to expend energy 
in order to make sure that the calculations the microprocessor are doing are actually correct. Um, also, <coughs> there's a problem in that microprocessor silicon chips are fundamentally basically a two-dimensional object. Now, they have many layers in them, okay, because you're layering up material. But fundamentally, it's on a one millimeter thick um, die. Now, you could argue, well, let's just go to three dimensions, because brains are three-dimensional. But there's no real, really good way as yet of fabricating um, microprocessors in three dimensions. You, what tends to happen is, let's say, a mi one microprocessor probably takes 150 watts of power in a space that's about a couple of centimetres by a couple of centimetres and is flat. Okay? If you start stacking these up or trying to fabricate them in three dimensions, you have a problem getting rid of the heat. Now, you then have the amazing fact that your brain requires about 20 watts this big old lump of stuff needs about 20 watts and it's all in three dimensions. And not only is it all in three dimensions, it's massively more densely packed. Um, if you compare it to what people can currently make using a technology that is now coming up against the limit of uh, how much you can actually pack in there. Um, so not only do you not really understand what a lot of what brains are doing, you can't make anything at the moment that's remotely as... Um, densely packed and connected, or remotely as energy efficient. And that's another reason, I think, um, that singularity, the idea is actually quite a long way off. Because you can bang on about how fast progress is, um, is as much as you like, but the fact is that no one has any idea how to make something that complicated. We'd like to thank Audible.com for sponsoring this episode of Computerfile. And if you like books, get over to audible.com slash computerfile and there's a chance to download one for free. They've got 180,000 titles to choose from, so you're bound to find something you like. And if you're interested, as most computer files probably are, in artificial intelligence, the singularity, and the things we've been talking about in this video, check out Machines of Loving Grace by John Markoff. It should be right up your street. So thanks again to Audible.com for sponsoring this episode of Computer File. So maybe it hijacks the world's stamp printing factories? Or perhaps it writes a virus and it hijacks all the computers in the world to get all of the printers in the world to do nothing but print stamps. Um, so building a, a model of the behaviour of a human by watching the way they play um, gets you into territories that are, that are vastly harder even than Go.